Good evening, everyone. Good to see everyone tonight. Hope everyone's doing well. Um, you've got classes in the back for the young kids. The teenagers are in here with us tonight, along with the adults. And I'll introduce our speaker here in one moment. Just a couple of announcements <clears throat> uh, upcoming this week. Uh, this coming Sunday afternoon, uh, at our normal time of 6.30 on Sunday night, we'll be having a fellowship meal, if you want to call it that, I guess. But I'm cooking hamburgers and hot dogs, so we'll have kind of a little cookout. Uh, we're asking everybody to bring like a side dish, chips, or a two-liter drink or dessert to share. Uh, we were going to do it um, at the White House down the, the, uh, where Eli and them live, but something's changed there, and we're not unable to do that. We're just going to eat inside the fellowship hall. We'll have our devotional in there, um, do a little bit of singing. And then when it gets dark, we've got fireworks, and we'll shoot off fireworks in the back parking lot. So those of you that live around the church building uh, might want to tell your neighbors, hey, come on and join us for food and fellowship, and then also uh, put their dogs up and chain them down and come join us for fireworks. So we'll do that at dark. And... Um, that's coming up. <clears throat> VBS is coming up fast approaching. There's sign-up sheets out there in the foyer for T-shirts, for workers, for uh, just all kinds of things. So work, look out there in the foyer for that. They're still looking for decor and all those items that you've seen up on the board and also in the Pathfinder. And uh, that's going on. Um, uh, we heard uh, this afternoon Mark Lane is getting to come home. So he's on his way home this afternoon. So that's good for Brother Mark. Um, we heard, does anyone know, because I did not get a chance to check today, I uh, heard Miss Biola's not doing well. Is she at home? Does anybody check on Miss Biola lately? She's at home. All right, I will check on her first thing in the morning, stop by and see her. I heard she's not been feeling well, so keep her in your prayers and all the others on our prayer list. And then uh, before I introduce our speaker, one more good announcement tonight after church services. Everyone's invited to stay around, I think, right, Brian? We're going to invite everybody. Uh, Nash Ballou is going to get baptized tonight after church services. Um, so he was thinking about it at church camp and um, decided to do it this week. So we're going to praise that. Uh, unfortunately, if you don't know, our baptistry is broke. <laughs> so we have, uh, if, you, uh, if you've seen it in the fellowship hall, we have that big black trough, that water trough that we put Cokes and stuff in. We got it filled up. And we got it over by the playground. So if anybody wants to come up, you can drive up. You can walk up to the playground underneath the big tree. And we're going to baptize. Uh, Brian's going to baptize Nash over there in that uh, water trough. So we'll, we'll, get him dunked, we'll get him dunked one way or another. He's excited. Outside in the water trough. That's a country boy right there. So that's good. So uh, he's excited and we're excited for the family. So we'll do that. Tonight, we have the privilege to hear uh, Brother Kenneth Grizzle from, am I saying your last name correctly? Grizzle? Grizzle? Grizzle. All right. Like Frizzle, Grizzle. All right. Um, I thought of that by uh, Brother Ray Frizzle, <laughs> preached down in Tennessee, passed away earlier this year. Um, Brother Ray baptized me, by the way, but that's a side note. Sorry. Uh, Brother Kenneth comes to us from the Greenwood Park Church of Christ. He's originally from Winchester, Tennessee. And he served several churches, and he's been at Greenwood Park since January 2016. Uh, he and his wife, Lori, met at Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee. And they have three grown married children. And I understand they have five beautiful granddaughters and one more granddaughter on the way due in September. Is that correct? And um, I have not heard the privilege to her brother Kenneth live and in person. I have heard him over video and uh, Eli recommended you highly. So, several of my friends recommend you highly from um, Greenwood Park that I know. And I know maybe others here in our congregation might have heard you. And I'm, I'm excited to hear you tonight bring you the lesson. Uh, he was instrumental. He and I talked last year at length about uh, what we're looking into, our small group program. And he put me on some um, news about that and some information about that. So I appreciate that. So he and I have talked several times. But... Looking forward to hearing his lesson tonight, and uh, let's just give him his, uh, give him our undivided attention as he comes and speaks to us. Brother Kenneth. I feel like a long walk down here. Good 
you guys like to be back there, <laughs> just, like, just like we do at uh, Greenwood Park. And uh, it's good to, I'm excited to be here um, with you tonight. I've, I've uh, able to see uh, the uh, beautiful children's facility you have, and of course this beautiful facility, and we, and honestly, after going through the children's facility, I'm going to try not to be jealous. I know that's a sin, but uh, when you come to Greenwood Park and you drive up and somebody drives up and comes to our parking lot and they see our church building and they come for the first time, they probably look and they probably stay for a while, look for a while and then they say, boy, I hope the people are nice. You know, that's kind of the way of anyway, that's the way uh, it feels, but we, uh, maybe we'll get some ideas and, and work on that. And it is the people. We've heard that for years, haven't we, that it's the people uh, that, uh, that matter. So I am, um, um, I know that uh, you have, we've all been through the same things, you know, in the last year and a half, it's been, uh, been really insane, and I know that uh, you guys had some adversity, and that we were praying uh, for families that uh, uh, here uh, during um, the COVID crisis, and and, uh, of course, I don't know that that's over with. I don't know how that works. Uh, but we live in crazy times. I mean, and you don't even need a pandemic uh, to get crazy. I mean, it's really, I uh, hope that you're weathering that well. So he's already introduced my wife. I brought my wife, Lori, and, and uh, it's Ruth, and, and uh, got some others from Greenwood Park. They're here, and it's good to see them. Um, so I'm not really, okay, so first of all, in fairness to Steve, I am from Warren County, Tennessee originally, not Warren County, Kentucky. And in my hometown, which I guess is the way you're supposed to pronounce the name, my name is Grizzle, okay? And uh, we moved to Nashville, and they said Grizzle, and we're like, you know, that sounds a little better. So we got a little family feud going on in our family. Every time we go to a reunion, it's the Grizzle reunion. It's not the Grizzle reunion. So in fairness, uh, I, usually I just either way works. Either way works. It doesn't, doesn't matter. But I grew up about 45 miles south of that because I'm an accident. Uh, I was, uh, my family is, uh, uh, my parents are quite a bit older, or quite a bit older, and uh, my sister, my oldest sister, 17 years older than me, and the one closest to me was uh, 10 years older than me. And, and so uh, I grew up, I've never lived in Winchester. I've lived in, uh, I'll just say Winchester. You ever live somewhere and you don't live, I've never lived in a, in a city limit in my life. So... Uh, but we say Winchester because most people haven't heard of that either. But if they have, that's the one place they would have heard of. I actually grew up on a little farm in between uh, Winchester and Cowan, Tennessee. If you know anything about that area, off of Mont Eagle Mountain, you go through Swanee, then you go down. Cowan's the first town off the mountain. and So it was, a, it was a good place to be from, close to Huntsville and Chattanooga and Nashville. And grew up, uh, basically, I grew up in the church, bathed in the baptistry, slept in the pews, you know, whatever it is they say, and uh, been in the church all my life, went to Lipscomb, as I've already mentioned, met Lori, but I literally, I really didn't meet Lori there. We went to school there for four years, and I don't even, we don't remember seeing each other. And I, It's not that big a campus, but we really don't remember seeing each other. Part of the reason was because she's always been, uh, you know, right on the straight and narrow. I wasn't so much so when I was in college. I wasn't really on a path to preach much of my college years, so we didn't run, well, actually, we did have a lot of the same friends, but how we met is interesting because Marlon Conley was uh, my professor. I was a, a communications and Bible major, and I had him for more classes. I had him almost every quarter, and one day after class, he said, I was in my senior year, and he said, Kenneth, I, I want you to uh, come to church Wednesday night. I got this girl I want you to meet. He said, she'd make a great preacher's wife. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm planning on being a preacher, but that's just not really exactly my dream is someone that your description of her is that she'll make a great preacher's wife, you know? So it's kind of like, well, then lo and behold, Lori, I would go to Essel Springs where my parent, my dad was an elder there, and I went there once a month and preached. And Lori's sister married a guy that was a friend of mine from high school, and Lori's sister had told Lori that there was this guy that she wanted to meet, and she told she didn't have such a glowing report either. He said he's tall, he has glasses, and he's a preacher. And so her idea was, well, wow, I really want to meet him, you know. So that's kind of the way we were. But I thought I'd get an A if I went. So I went that Wednesday night, 
And I went and met her, and a couple weeks later, we went on a first date. Six months later, we were engaged. Eighteen months later, we were married. And I have taken her all over the place. I've been in, I started out in Red Bull and Springs, started preaching there when I was in college, and then just moved there when I was still single and lived there for a while. And then we moved to Dayton, Ohio, and I was a youth minister there for three years. And then we went to Pacific, to San Clemente, California, where I preached for three years in a small church there. And, and that was so expensive. We loved our time there, but then we moved all the way. We liked the beach, so we went all the way to Atlantic and moved to Savannah, Georgia for five years. And so we thought, wait, we've tried everything but the Gulf Coast. So for 10 years, I then went to Panama City, and I preached the Palo Alto Church there for 10 years. And then something came over me, and we moved to Jackson, Tennessee, which technically is not even Tennessee. That's West Tennessee, and West Tennessee is really Eastern Oklahoma. That's what that is. So, I mean, it's like it was. But I moved to Jackson, Tennessee from all those years of being on the coast, which was turned out to be a great experience for us. I was at Campbell Street there for 10 years, but my children were able to find good Christian mates there, and, and uh, my daughter, my youngest daughter, was able to be the one child that went to the same school all the way through and actually met her husband, and they were smitten with each other in the third grade. And they got married their junior year in college at, Lips, at Harding. And so, uh, um, so that's been kind of the experience they have. So, yes, I have five granddaughters, no grandsons, five lovely granddaughters. If there are any of you here that have some grandsons or maybe some sons um, in the, between the ages of zero and eight, we'll go ahead and push it up to ten. And uh, if you have any, uh, then see me afterwards, and I'll, I'll, I'll call my kids, the parents. I mean, they, they probably have to have something to do with it, too. But anyway, we'll go ahead and we'll arrange something for them. you got the boys. Arrange marriages sounds really good uh, nowadays. But uh, anyway, so that's kind of our, my story. So uh, I was honored for the opportunity to talk about this, um, being sure of what you hope for. Uh, those are powerful words in a world that's not sure of anything, isn't it? That we can be sure of what we hope for, and we can be sure of what we hope for. My topic specifically is Samson and Jephthah. Um, and I guess he gave me the side topic of administer justice and gain what was promised. And I'm going to be honest, I'm not going to talk a long time about the subject of, of justice. I'm actually talking about that on Wednesday nights at Greenwood Park because it is a uh, it is a very important topic to God. We're going through the prophets and in prophecy, it's almost always it seems to come up somehow or another the lack of justice that's being shown. But at the same time, in our culture, it's kind of an over it's kind of a misunderstood word because many talk about justice and social justice. And like I said, justice is paramount to God. But what's described by just, as justice in our culture uh, is really, much of it's not justice at all. Uh, it's more like vengeance. <laughs> and God clearly says, vengeance is mine. In fact, I want to just read a couple of bonus scriptures before I get into the actual topic. In, uh, in Romans 12, the best uh, description of what I, we as believers, who we're called to be. And um, He talks about in First. Verses 1 and 2, 1 through 3, it talks about that we're to offer ourselves as living sacrifices to God. And that then he transforms us by the renewing of our minds. And then we kind of have what I love about the last part of chapter 12 is there is a, uh, it's not a checklist really, but it kind of shows what it looks like to live according to God's will. What it looks like when believers do that. And they have these practical bullet points, if you will. In verse 14, it says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil. No one evil for evil. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peacefully with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it's written, vengeance is mine I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
So we're called as believers in this crazy world, and we've always been called to do this, to, to live a higher standard. We're to live to a higher standard. We're created to treat everyone the same. We're called by Jesus to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us. But that being said, we're also called, and this is probably where we drop the ball the most, constantly God tells us how much he hates it when we oppress others. We're to defend the defenseless. We are to love others. We're to, and, and the, the judgment scene, when it talks about judging and um, it talks about the judgment day, it says that, that you, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and in prison and you visited me. And, uh, and we're told through James that, that, we're to, that we're to be with the widows and the, and the orphans and the poor and the outcasts and all these that we are to, to reach out to. That, but the truth is that God is not pleased when his people oppress and mistreat. So we're called to have the mind of Christ in Philippians 2. We're called to be servants. Uh, servants to all. I mean, we see Jesus in his last night on the last lesson he wanted to show them that when he realized that all power had been his, as in John 13, is he began to wash his disciples' feet. So our culture, in the name of justice, honestly has left people that are really oppressed and victims and hurting, they've left them out of the process while trying to, if you will, oppress what they call the oppressors. Nowhere does God tell us to oppress the oppressors. Our job is to try to, to be with those and to help those who are in need and help those who are hurting and to bless those that are victims and to serve. And Jesus, when he started his ministry in Luke 4, came for the brokenhearted, came for those who were hurting. And so, so this is God also, in all cases, God is interested in reconciliation and forgiveness. He's always interested in that being the end result of things. And there's, there's no room for that in so many cases in our culture. It's one strike and you're out. There is no justification. There is no coming out of it. There's no getting out of the hole. There's no, there's no uh, place for redemption. So what this culture needs more than anything else, uh, this is my little mini sermon before the sermon, is Grace. What we have and what's been given to us is grace. And we need to be a people that model that, which obviously will involve loving and serving those who are oppressed and those who are hurting. But it will also involve loving and praying for those who do the oppressing. And that's what makes it so hard sometimes to be Christians because it is so, I mean, in Acts they called it the way more about the way that they lived their lives. It wasn't like anything else. And so all that, I want to turn now our attention to our passage for tonight, which this kind of fits together. It all fits with our lives. And Hebrews 11 is the passage. And I want to just read the specific part that inspires my, uh, my portion of the lesson. Uh, I may never get asked back again because I'm, I'm, I'm going my own way with it a little bit and not necessarily with the direction I was supposed to go, but I think it'll apply. But So in, in Hebrews 11, and I'm in the wrong place, it might help to be in actual Hebrews 11. In Hebrews 11, verse 29, it says, By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, uh, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets. Through faith, conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of, fire, uh, power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, but foreign armies to fight. And so the, the list goes on and on. But my specific, specific area to talk about is two individuals. And by the way, is that not quite the list of ragtags and, and uh, misfits? When I look at that list and also another famous list in the Bible, the genealogy of Christ, I don't know about you, but I see more sinner <laughs> than I see saint. I see people that were flawed and people, and honestly, 
God doesn't have anything else to work with, does he? (laughs) If God's going to use humans, he's going to use people that are flawed. And the two individuals that I've been given to talk about tonight uh, certainly fit uh, like we do, the flawed category. So I'm going to turn to Judges 11. By the way, I don't have a PowerPoint tonight. I have, uh, don't know the last time I preached without a PowerPoint, but I know in my preparation, it was such a freeing experience. I may get used to it. Uh, but um, there were some times I thought, man, I, had, I wish I had this to, to put on PowerPoint tonight. So, so everything, uh, you know, you may have to go old school, get, go old school, get your phone out and look at your Bible or whatever, or look at your Bible. Uh, Judges 11, or you can just listen. Judges 11 is the scripture that we look at. Now, I want to spend most of my time talking about the lesser known of the two. Uh, Jephthah is what I call him. His name actually in Hebrew is Yifta, which actually is pretty, it's easier to pronounce, but I'm going to go ahead and go with Jephthah because that's what I'm used to. And so, but uh, if we, if we've learned Bible stories, uh, we've all learned about Samson, right? I mean, most anybody that's had stories has learned about Samson. He's one of the stories that children hear about because it's an interesting story. Um, But I will say a few things about him. I'm also going to close lord willing with something about him and a lesson from his life and but when i was putting together a study in when i was in california for new believers to trying to get them to help understand the bible i I put together some some little list of things just for fun Uh, and one of my lists was called the dumb jocks list okay and i played sports so i'm not trying to pick on any particular group of people but you've heard that term before probably a dumb jock And the first dumb jock in the Bible is Esau. And let me explain that. Esau was the guy who who sold his birthright for some porridge because his stomach was growling. He sold his birthright because he was starving, he was going to die. So Samson uh, belongs in that list with Esau. Here he is, this this mighty, mighty man who, uh, he was a Nazarite. Uh, He's dedicated to the Lord. He came to this earth based on a promise delivered by an angel of the Lord. In uh, number six, when it talks about a Nazarite, it says that a Nazarite is to be dedicated to the Lord. They're not to have a razor come to their hair. Uh, They were not to drink strong drink or anything from the fruit of the vine. And they were not to touch anything that was dead. Now, those of you that know a little bit about the story of Samson, if you know the story of Samson, I think we all can agree Samson had to be the all-time worst at keeping the Nazarite vow. He broke them all. I don't know about the strong drink. I don't remember that. But he he broke definitely the part about being dedicated to God. And while he made up for the drinking part anyway by doing pretty much everything else. And Samson uh, even had this moment where he touched something dead. We know that story. And he slaughtered the Philistines with the the jawbone. And uh, his greatest fault, however was a common fault among many of the people mentioned in Hebrews 11. It was the same issue that David had. It's the same issue that Solomon had. And you can go back and Judah had the same issue. His, his greatest fault was his failure to stay dedicated to the Lord. And he loved foreign women. Judges 14, he first fell for a daughter of a Philistine. And his whole problems and difficulties came because he was, he was deceived and, and he got angry, and that's when he just started letting loose on all the Philistines. And Judges 16, it was a prostitute. And of course, three verses later, it's Delilah. Now, are you talking about being foolish? I don't know. if you have ever heard the, t- the saying, third time is a charm? Now, most people, if they had a girl that said, tell me the secret to your strength, he tells her the secret to the strength, which is a deception, but then she does whatever it is he says, and then she says, the Philistines are upon you. He wakes up, and guess what? The Philistines are upon him. You think after two times, you're like, uh-uh, I'm not going to do that. But he was so smitten and addicted to this woman that instead of putting two and two together and considering maybe she doesn't feel the same way about me that I feel about her, he goes ahead and tells her. And so this is kind of Samson's, I mean, there are only two examples of Samson in the scriptures speaking to God. One, he's like Esau, crying to God because he's thirsty. 
The second is at his death. And at his death, even then, in verses 28 and 29 of chapter 16, it says, And Samson called to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once. O oh God, that I may avenge, be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And even then, as much as anything, it was because he wanted revenge for his eyes. But for some reason, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in Hebrews chapter 11, he is listed as one of the heroes of faith. And obviously, the fact that he did call on the Lord and cry out to God for whatever reason, he obviously knew and believed in the power of God to deliver him. And through that act, God did bring justice to the people of Israel who had been oppressed. So, the lesson that we have, really in all of Hebrews 11, but the lesson that we have here is that God uses imperfect people. Samson's story should really increase all of our faith. He truly is that we do have a God that's compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in love. And so Samson's an example of the type of person that God will use. And uh, that, that, that's just what I want to say about him right now. I'm excited to talk about uh, Jephthah a little bit as well because his story is similar at least by his beginnings as some of my family's story. Um, if you'll bear with me a moment, I had a, a grandfather who I didn't know very well because I was uh, a late bloomer and came along late. I was blessed to have a father who was in World War II and, and to have parents that their shaping years were spent in the Depression. And, um, and that put me in an advantage with some of my friends. I felt very blessed to have that as parents. But that means that my grandparents were even older, you know. So my, my well, obviously they would be, but uh, my grandparents were... Um, my granddaddy was born in late 1890s, or early 1890s. And, uh, and this story has special meaning to my mother's father, Ernest Grandy. He was born at that time, and uh, he was the son, the only son of a single woman. He was an illegitimate child, if you will. And uh, he was... Uh, I just want you to imagine for a moment, his mother never married, always the two of them, middle of Tennessee. Just imagine what life was like in the late 19th century, early 20th century uh, in the South, in a, in a very much a Bible Belt area. Um, praise God that he was, uh, his mother was, there was a family that kind of took her in, and, and, and there was a man that kind of took him in as well. But all his life, he was trying to figure out, how can I rise above my beginnings? How can I um, get to this? How, how can I be, um, how can I get out of this? How can I, what can I do? Because it was such a difficult uh, upbringing and so much prejudice that was against him in that time and so he discovered as a teenager the story of Jephthah and that became his story that he chose to cling to a certain part of it and that is in chapter 11 of Judges Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior but he was the son of a prostitute Gilead was the father of Jephthah and Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about that and read the rest of that in just a moment. But my, my grandfather clinged to that story and used him as his role model. Because someone that had the same kind of beginnings as he had and yet ends up in Hebrews 11. And so not only did he choose that as his life, but he, he went on and he, became a, he was a dairy farmer and he was an itinerant preacher who helped start churches in 10 counties in Tennessee throughout his life. 
Um, unfortunately, I only knew him for, I, I, I mean, I just remember him because he'd had a stroke and he had only lived two years after I was born. I just remember him rocking in a chair saying nothing. And so it blew my mind. Well, my mother would tell me stories and the family would tell me stories that he was a preacher and that he, he did all that and he spent his time with that. And so the thing that was interesting about Jephthah, getting back to him, is he, unlike Samson, he didn't start out dedicated to the Lord. He actually chose to commit his life to the Lord. So the story, uh, it's, it's like I said, dear to, to our family. But uh, I've also spent a lot of time in this story because this story, as much as any, uh, maybe more than any, has troubled me all my life. Uh, I've been troubled by at least the teaching that I received on what happened with Jephthah, which when you read it, especially King James, uh, it looks like it is what it is. And I, I was troubled with the how all this came about. And so in studying, I've discovered that most scholars would kind of agree with what, what, I've, what I've discovered in looking at it, because there's one word one word that could go either way that changes the entire meaning of the story of Jephthah. It's funny how that happens sometimes. But we're going to get that in just a moment. But let's, let's read the rest of this. So verse 3 says, chapter 11, it says, Then Jephthah fled from his brothers, and he lived in the land of Tob. And worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and were out with him. When I think about Jephthah too, I get this image of, the, of Robin Hood. It was like a Robin Hood type individual and the guys that were around him. And when you think of worthless fellows, the first thing that came to many people's minds is that they were idle and all that. But when you really look it up, it, it means exactly what it says. It, it, is, it means it in this way, though. They were poor. People like him without substance, people without inheritance, people without. And so it was like a band of a band of a merry band that had come with him and was with, around him. He says, after a time. The Ammonites made war against Israel, and when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob, and they said to Jephthah, Come and be our leader, that we might, we might fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Do you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you're in distress? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, That is why we have turned to you now that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be one head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. And the elders of Gilead and Jephthah said to, said to Jephthah, The Lord will be witness between us if we do not do what you said. And so Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord, at Mizpah. And there's so many lessons and that there's no time to talk about all that. But, um, but here we see uh, Jephthah. See, God has a way of working things out when we wait on him and trust in him. And God turned this around. And God's the one that kind of orchestrates all this so that he, he, he was the very ones that rejected him are bringing him back. But let's get back to what Jephthah's known for. What Jephthah's known for you may be thinking, I don't know what he's, what he, what he's known for. He's known for a tragic vow that he makes. That's the part that troubles me. And the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, verse 29. Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you'll give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them. The Lord gave them into his hand, and he struck them from Arrow to the neighborhood of Minna, 20 cities, and as far as Abel, whatever that is, with a great blow. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. Then Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, and behold, the daughter, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances, and she was the only child besides her. He had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me, for I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my voice. And she said to him, My father, 
You have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do not, I mean, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth, now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies and the Ammonites. So she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Leave me alone two months, that I may go up and down into the mountains and weep for my virginity, and I my companions. And he said, Go. Then he sent them away for two months. She departed, she and her companions, and wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow that he had made. She had never known a man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughter of Israel went by year by, daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days in the year. So the troubling part to me, I mean, I think it would be pretty obvious. It says in the scripture the Holy Spirit had come upon Jephthah, and Jephthah makes, even though the Holy Spirit had come upon Jephthah, he shows us that we still have that battle that's going on within us. We talk about it even, of course, in the Old Testament, the Spirit would come upon people, and then it was, it was more like that. But as believers, thanks to Christ's resurrection and sending the Holy Spirit, and through our baptism, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit is with us. But even then, we're told that we have this war that's constantly going on. Even though the Spirit indwells us, we have this war between the flesh and the Spirit. And Samson and David are definitely proof that humans are still capable of rash and foolish statements and decisions even when the Spirit comes upon them. But as we see, I mean, let me just share with you the story that I always heard, which at first appearance is going to be the story I just read. So Jephthah makes this rash vow without thinking about it. He bargains with the Lord, thinking that, all, that, thinking that it will be his dog Spot or his sheep or his little lamb Fluffy that will be the one to come to him and meet him. At least that's what the deacon in my Sunday school class taught me. And it's his daughter. And Jephthah, of course, is devastated. So the daughter says, it's okay, Dad. Let me run through the mountains and mourn my virginity and then do with me as you vowed. And, and that's what he does. And he gives her to the Lord and sacrifices her as a burnt offering. The end. And I can remember even at 10 or 11 or whatever I was when I first heard that story, thinking, wait, wait, wait just a minute. No, 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 no. No way. It's a tragic story. We can all go home now and mourn the precious girl's death at the hands of her foolish father. Now, that's not the part of the story that my grandfather focused on, just so you know. It was simply the birth and the end result of Hebrews 11. But I just want to share with you the, uh, you know, show my age here that hurts and the not exactly I want to share with you the not exactly of this the Bible is pretty clear Um, it's pretty clear in what it says my dad and I used to debate this scripture all the time good memory there never want to debate with my dad by the way probably best but let me just state a little case I know I'm Amazing how uh, time goes by. In Deuteronomy, God says, "You shall not worship the you shall worship the Lord your you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abominable thing that the Lord hates, they have done for their gods. For they have burned their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods." Deuteronomy eighteen: There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering. And there's actually over 50 other scriptural references. In fact, most of the prophets' writings are because of this great sin that's happened in these other kingdoms. And now Israel, Israel through Manasseh, is participating in some of the same things and some of the other kings did as well. I don't think God could be any clearer about his feelings in the scriptures. And so my struggle, even as a 10 and 11-year-old, is I knew these scriptures because my mom and dad read to me every day. I praise God for that. I knew those scriptures, and I'm like, how did he make it in Hebrews 11 if he sacrificed his daughter? This is the greatest abomination to God there is possible. He shows it. He proves it in 39 books of the Old Testament. 
So, I was in my late 20s in San Clemente when I was really struggling with this and preaching, and I, just, I was on that subject, and so I gave the, I shared what I'm about to share now, and uh, one thing I've noticed in 35 years of preaching is that whenever you're going to share something that's controversial, that an expert in the field that's on the controversy part is always in the audience, or your dad's in the audience. I got hammered, and I was, I, mean, I came out, but I still held on to my conviction. But I think that this, this is so encouraging, and I think it will build up to what, as we close, what this is all about. So Jephthah is chosen by God because he was a man of faith. He's a son of a prostitute and a mighty warrior. He's also one of the few judges, by the way. He's one of the few judges. He's actually, one of the first things I read, he actually shields the glory to God. He says, if God wills to do this, and he, he shields the will, the glory to God, even though he's a mighty warrior, he does that. His humble beginnings, I think, probably helped the process of him being humble before God and trusting in God. But he doesn't just go into battle. He goes before the Lord in that scripture that I just read a moment ago. His love for his daughter is evidence that he was a godly man and a great father. The fact that she came out to greet him and she was dancing and playing in the trample, uh, tr- trampoline, tr- tambourine, whatever it is. I'm, I'm Church of Christ. I don't know the instruments. Shows that she adored him and his response shows that he adored her. I mean, he had done a good job as a father. Obviously, his daughter was full of faith in this time in Israel's history. Uh, how did she develop that faith? Well, I think probably he had practiced with her the Shema that tells us that, uh, um, where it says that, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Talk about it when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. But what about the vow? I want you to just notice a, a couple of things here. Jephthah says, whatever comes out, whatever comes out, from the doors of my house. Whatever comes out from the doors of my house shall be the Lord's or dedicated to God and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. Well, first of all, that's kind of redundant. If you're going to offer it to the Lord, are you going to offer it to the Lord or are you going to offer it as a burnt offering? That's like a, that's like a person saying, separate and apart from the communion, you know, which, which is it? So which is it? Are you going to dedicate the Lord or are you going to offer it as a burnt offering? If you dedicate the Lord, why would you need to offer it as a burnt offering? That was kind of the confusion that I have. So as I studied more, and one of the things I discovered as I started looking at what scholars believe, there's a Hebrew word, and I'm not making this up. This is the way it is. The Hebrew word for and is also the same word for or. And for whatever reason, it's translated and here. So it's left up to the translators to determine it. Now, all the evidence in looking at this scripture and knowing what we know about God would be that he would say, because listen, he doesn't say whoever, he says whatever. That leaves room for anything that comes. An animal, a person, he says whatever comes. I'm going to dedicate it to the Lord. Let's just add, let's just change it to or, which it very well, I believe it is. But I, I don't know that it is, but I believe that it is. Dedicate it to the Lord or offer it as a burnt offering. It doesn't take away from the tragedy, by the way, for him not to offer his daughter as a burnt offering. She's his only child. If you read your Bible in the Old Testament, you know how important it is to have offspring. Children are heritage of the Lord. Psalm 127 says offspring is his reward. So he says whatever, which covers everything. So whatever it is, based on that statement, is I got it covered. So, 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 so what's it going to do with a goat, a dog? Well, you offer it as a burnt offering. But a person, on the other hand, well, there is Samson, the very other person. There's a Nazarite vow. Leviticus 27 talks about dedicating a child to the Lord. Exodus 38 talks about women being set aside to serve at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. The sin of Eli's sons was that they were lying with these women at the door of the tabernacle. But there are women that were virgins that were dedicated to the Lord. And I think the evidence in this scripture is that that's exactly what happened. It makes sense then, whatever comes, I will either dedicate it to the Lord or will offer it as a burnt offering. 
because her response is, let me mourn my virginity. Because she would never marry. She would never bear a child. She was the only child of Jephthah. Another evidence that Jephthah was a godly man. Everybody else had 30 sons with 30 donkeys. Even Gideon had 70 sons. That tells us something else about Jephthah, by the way. Probably he learned that from being uh, an illegitimate child. Probably he learned that from that, is that he was evidently must have been faithful to one wife, unlike everybody else, because he had one child. Everybody else had 60 or 70 sons, not just children. Maybe faithfulness was a way of life for Jephthah. So he did with her according to his vow, it says. It doesn't say he offered her as a sacrifice. He did according to the vow. And after that, even after her vow, it talks about her virginity. When it goes back, it doesn't talk about a sacrifice. It talks about how that she did not have children and that even to this day that daughters of Israel mourn for four days over her which is also an evidence of Jephthah's faith and influence that the people of Israel would do that. So she's given to God. She knew no man and would know no other man. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. But anyway, the question that arises from this, even with that, is, okay, all right, since we're talking about sacrifices, then why would God sacrifice his only son? How is that acceptable? And, and there, there, there are several reasons why the sacrifice of Christ on the cross doesn't violate that prohibition. First, Jesus wasn't merely human. If he were, then his sacrifice would have been insufficient in the first place because there's no person that could possibly cover the sins, the multitude of sins that we have. We'd have to, he'd have to be sacrificed over and over again. Neither could one infant, in, finite human life alone or atone for sin against one infinite God. The only Bible sacrifice would be an infinite one, which means only God himself could atone for the sins of mankind. Only God himself. That's why God had to become a man and dwell among us, because no other sacrifice would suffice. Second, God didn't sacrifice Jesus, really. Jesus, as he says himself, God incarnate, incarnate, sacrificed himself. No one forced him. He said, I'll lay down my life. I'll lay it down of my own accord. No one takes it from me. I lay it down, and then he says something else. And I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. So he he sacrificed himself to God the Father and fulfilled all the requirements of law according to Romans 8. But unlike the temporary sacrifices, Jesus once for all time sacrificed was followed by a resurrection because he could take it back up again. So all that and the lessons for us in this is that God can use anyone. Which means he can use you and he can use me. Even though Hebrews 11 is about the heroes of faith, it's really not so much about the faith or our actions as it is the object of our faith. Hebrews 11 crescendos, and by the way, they're not chapters and verses in the original text. Hebrews 11 finishes that whole great step. It it goes in and it crescendos into this statement in chapter 12. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured endured such opposition from sinners, so that you too may not grow weary and lose heart. So we have Samson, who came into this world with a holy guest, an angel of the Lord coming and announcing his birth who went about it quite differently than Jephthah, but they both make the list side by side. He had all the advantages. He was a Nazarite. He didn't live up to his conviction, to conditions. He wouldn't follow through on the promise. You think, well, God had big plans, and Samson blew them, so you would think, well, God would give up on his promise. So there's a lesson from Samson as well. And the lesson is that we mess up, 
We sin. We make mistakes. We fail. But that doesn't hinder God's promise. I mean, yeah, it was in his death, but God still did through Samson what he said he would. That this holy God can use flawed people like us. That's what God does. He accomplishes his plan. He knows our future, and he even knows the mistakes that we're going to make. And when he makes a promise, he already knows every obstacle that's going to come against us. And, and he knows the promise that's going to stand, and he knows what he's going to do. And, and so he, he delivers. There had to be people of better character to choose from than Samson. But Samson stands as a testimony, just like Jephthah to us, that God doesn't revoke his gifts and promises because we often fail. God loves our faithfulness. But you know what? God can work through those like Samson that don't just stumble. Some of us don't just stumble. Some of us seem to stumble every step of the way. And we just don't learn anything easy. And even in spite of those flaws, God can fulfill his promise through us. And that's the good news. God's not defeated by our failure. And that Hebrews 11 says, I know I'm out of time. I always, I'm, the joke at Greenwood Park is, you know, just forget about lunch. Okay, so uh, I'm almost through. I mean, like really almost through, I promise. Um, but Hebrews 11 says, in another place about faith, it says, without faith it's impossible to please him. For those that come to him must believe that he exists and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so the answer for us is to diligently seek him. It also says in Jeremiah that you'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God rewards our seeking of him. He's not scratching his head. And here's the thing. In this world that we live in right now, as crazy as it is, many of us get discouraged. Many of us think there's no hope. I hear a lot of Christians acting like there's no hope. What is the title of this message? What is the title of the theme of this? Is that we receive we hope for being sure of what we hope for we can be sure but the way to be sure is to not set our eyes on the obstacles in this world it's not to get our information from the media or the social media it's not to depend on the government or the politicians to figure things out it never has been that and if anything has happened in this year and a half with covid and everything else if anything else, if nothing else has come our way, what we need to know is, is the answer, is the only answer, and always been the answer, is to fix our eyes on Jesus. It is to fix our eyes on the hope that we have. As I joke in the church at Greenwood Park, every Sunday I find a time to bring up what we call the attachments. We put available to everybody. I've made available to everybody as an attachment. The names of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And every week they roll their eyes. But I say, get your eyes on the Lord. He's not wringing his hands. He's not scratching his head figuring out, well, what are we going to do? Nobody's trusting me. Oh, the world's terrible. Get your eyes off of everything else and put your eyes on the Lord. Isaiah says, you keep him in perfect peace. Him whose mind is stayed on you. Because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord our God is an everlasting rock. Trust in the Lord forever. No matter what this is, the one thing we know is that God got this. And we learned that, even though it took a long time, his death for Samson. And even though Jephthah made a, 
rash vow, God honored him, and he's honored today because of his commitment to God. Lord God, you are God. You're great. You are the Lord, and you, to you alone belongs all glory and praise. You are the Lord, and beside you there's no other Savior. You are the Lord, and beside you there's no rock. You are the Lord, and beside you there is no other creator. You are the Lord, and beside you there's no, there's no one. There's no other peace. There's no other hope. There's no other way. You are the answer to every woe that we have in our culture. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. And Father, may we turn our eyes upon you and the hope that we have through you in this time. And may we shine in the midst of the darkness of this world. May we shine with the reasonableness and the self-control and the love and the light and the hope, living as people that are hopeful in the midst of a world with no hope. Now's the time. This is our Hebrews 11 moment, Father. So I pray here in Franklin and Bowling Green and Southern Kentucky and the uttermost parts of the world, Lord, as believers in Christ that will lift our eyes up to you and keep them there, place our hope in you. Sure, we're going to have troubles. Both of these guys did. Everybody does. We live in a fallen world. But thanks be to Jesus Christ. We are sure of what we hope for. And we lift our eyes to him. May he be glorified in our actions, in our lives, and all that we do. In Christ's name, amen. I guess that's it. <laughs>